We are in chapter 26, and we're on the um, second to the last section there, and we're going to be talking about disarmament and detente. And what are these things? Well, we're, we're going to focus on the hydrogen bomb, the campaign for disarmament, and the age of detente, those relationships with countries, and the SALT treaties. So let's begin. You can see the picture here, too. It's a picture of Nixon and um, uh, Brez, Brezhnev here, as we see their pictures. And um, on to looking at ban the bomb, all the things that, here's the relationship with Nixon and Red China here. It says, but this time I really mean it. This is the war, do they really mean the limiting of nuclear weapons? So let's begin. The hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller. So in 1949, Russians exploded their first atom bomb, and now a new arms race began. Edward T Teller, pictured here, was a Hungarian-born American physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project and planned a more powerful nuclear weapon. The hydrogen bomb was to be counterbalanced to the Soviet nuclear threat. So if we developed the hydrogen bomb, um, we would be ahead of the Soviets, right? As they had now the atom bomb. Well, J. Robert Oppenheimer, who had also helped develop the atomic bomb, now expressed a humanitarian concern at the proliferation of nuclear weapons, which, you know, it, it is a problem. So Oppenheimer, though, was a pro-communist and a top consultant to the United States Atomic Energy Commission. But he was sympathetic to the communist uh, cause in the past. In spite of the opposition, Teller, here's we have Edward Teller, pressed forward and became known as the father of the hydrogen bomb. The United States successfully don uh, uh, detonated the first hydrogen bomb at Niwatak Atoll of the Pacific on November 1st, 1952. So they tried it out on this small island out in the Pacific Ocean away from everyone, this hydrogen bomb. Now the nations of the world were being equipped with nuclear weapons. In 1967, um, all these nations listed here had atomic and hydrogen bombs. Great Britain, Russia, France, China. They also had ICBMs, which are intercontinental ballistic missiles. And they were developed to carry these bombs, these warheads across the globe. So we have Great Britain, Russia, France, and China with nuclear weapons. The Communist Fear of Deterrence. Well, in 1949, Winston Churchill declared, this is a long time, we're talking about 1949, he declared, it is certain that Europe would have been communized like Czechoslovakia and London under bombardment some time ago, but for the deterrent of the atomic bomb in the hands of the United States. So he was saying, because the United States had the atomic bomb, the um, Basically, communism, the commun uh, communist Russia didn't come in and take over all of Europe, you know, including um, uh, England. In 1950s, the United States possessed an, an overwhelming nuclear superiority that made the Soviet Union fearful of confronting the free world directly, knowing that we had the bomb and they didn't at that time. Because of this, the entire propaganda of apparatus of the communist bloc was directed towards somehow neutralizing or eliminating the United States' nuclear um, arsenal. So basically saying, well, we need to go in and tell the people here uh, to get, that they need to get rid of the bomb. So um, they had all this propaganda, an atomic war. This is tomorrow. The war is going to be destroyed by the, um, the nu a nuclear bomb attack. This propaganda on nuclear weapons continued, and proclamations about Im immorality or inhumanity, inhumanity of nuclear weapons, saying they're inhumane, 
and they're immoral, right? So, also about the dangers to mankind of nuclear warfare, our atomic fallout began to fill periodicals, those are magazines, in the West. The result was the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty signed in Moscow in 1963 by the representatives of the United States, Great Britain, and Soviet Union. So they got together on their first nuclear test ban treaty, right? It, it um, outlawed nuclear testing in outer space and in the atmosphere and underwater. Those are some of the things. The United States and Great Britain followed the terms of the treaty. They said, we'll follow these terms. Yes, they agreed. But the Soviet Union went on unhindered with this program of nuclear testing, lying, basically saying, oh yes, we're not gonna do that. But they went on and, and did it anyway. We cannot always trust, can we? The treaties are not always fall proof, are they? Nuclear blackmail. You see there the picture up there with um, China and its nuclear weapons and onto Russia still producing nuclear weapons after it promised it wouldn't. Because there were no controls, the Soviets could proceed secretly and undetected. As the Soviets and Red Chinese continued to test new weapons, the Americans and the British voluntarily abstained concentrating on disarmament. So the Americans of Britain were concentrating on disarming their nuclear weapons as the Soviets and Red Chinese were making more weapons, right? Or were concentrating on more weapons. By 1980, the Soviets had so many more lethal weapons than the United States that the threat of Soviet nuclear blackmail was a real possibility. And I remember in time back then that we had shelters that we had to go in case the nu a nuclear of a nuclear bombs attack from the Soviet Union. Disarmament, disarmament and globalism. So from the hysteric uh, hyster uh, from the hysteria of nuclear weapons emerged the nuclear freeze movement. See the nuclear freeze movement here to freeze nuclear weapons. Nuclear uh, freeze advocates and demands that American nuclear arsenal be frozen with no new improvement or no new rep weapons. They hoped the Soviet Union would reciprocate. So the globalists and the internationalists urge that all nations turn over their nuclear weapons to the United Nations or some other international agency. Everyone was supposed to turn in their nuclear weapons. And we're all gonna become a part of a one world economic, political, and social order. Fine, but who is going to run that one world power? Hmm? Maybe the Antichrist is what I say. The age of detente, that's a French word. The West pursued a policy of detente with communists. You see here them shaking hands, right? Detente is that French word that conveys the idea of reducing tension or hostility between nations, being friends um, and relating to these nations on a friendly basis. The United States tried to use the bargaining power and treaty making a deals with the Soviet Union and Red China. Is it really working? Hmm. Here's a picture up here. They're shaking hands, but of course the Soviet Union um, is, has in bondage many other countries. You know, you wonder when they shake hands what they have behind their backs, right? That's that picture in time. Testing detente. Detente with China. Since 1949, the United States refused to extend diplomatic relations with Mao Zedong's communist regime. Of course, they were killing hundreds and thousands of people. Hmm. Chiang Kai-shek was the nationalist government and they had been moved to Taiwan and at this time, we were only represented Taiwan. We, were only rep we only rep um, knew them as the legitimate Chinese government. We did not accept, I don't say represent, we did not accept Mao's um, Ch Red China. 
and we had relationships with um, Taiwan and Chiang Kai-shek. But during um, the administration of President Nixon and Henry Kissinger, his assistant for national security, we ended uh, um, opposition to communist China's membership in the United Nations. In spite of Taiwan's record of peace, Chiang Kai-shek, the United States voted on October of 1971 to expel Taiwan, the nationalist China, from the United Nations and admit communist China in its place. How terrible. How we, we again deserted Chiang Kai-shek and, and being the greatest friendship with the United States. And now we are going to support Red China, Communist China, under especially under Mao Zedong and what was going on, our horrific things in the treatment of, free, of the free people there. You know, tons of people have been executed and killed in, in the name of communism in China. So what's going on? Sounds pretty horrific, doesn't it? It's a picture of Nixon eating with um, the Chinese, the red Chinese um, diplomats and heads there. President Nixon and Henry Kissinger, they went on their goodwill tour in 1972. The age of detente symbolized when, symbolized when President Nixon and Henry Kissinger journeyed to Red China on a goodwill tour. They met with Mao Zedong and his closest advisor, Chao Enlai. And so here we have, you know, them actually meeting and shaking hands and becoming friendly with this great monster dictator, communism um, at its extreme, who had killed hundreds, hundreds of thousands, if not, um, in fact, millions of people. This set the stage for future relations, trade, and military planning between the United States and communist China. In 1978, the United States under President Jimmy Carter formally recognized communist China as the only legal government of China. So here we have President Carter recognizing communist China as the only legal government of China. Dante with the Soviet Union. In 1964, Soviet leaders deposed Nikita Khrushchev, forcing him into retirement and obscurity. And he was succeeded by Leonid Brezhnev. Brezhnev continued the policy of peaceful coexistence and used the West's Dante to his advantage. In 1975, Helsinki Accords, remember that, the Helsinki Accords happened. This is where the members of the free world signed with the communist bloc um, in an economic cooperation and cultural exchanges between the West and the East. And here you have a picture of Brezhnev um, meeting with President Nixon at this time. And later on, um, you'll find him uh, uh, meeting at the bottom with President Ford onto, um, you know, Ford and Carter. The result was an even greater transfer of technology from the free world to the communist bloc that enhanced the communist abilities to make war. So we started giving them our, um, basically our technology that we had, had acquired uh, and they were using it to actually using it in their war, in their war department, in their military department to make war. So here we have detente being turned around as we are looking to be friends with um, the Soviet Union and um, on in, of course, um, communist China, as we saw. And we have Leonid Brezhnev, you know, just ah, smiling and saying, yeah, see him up there in that corner with his, with his um, coat there, his fur coat with um, uh, President Ford there. 
and saying, ah, okay, yeah, come on in, let's make friends. Let's give me all your technology. Hmm. The greatest tragedy of the Helsinki Accords. The great tragedy was the West's recognition of the permanence of the post-World War II settlements that left the nations of Eastern Europe as captives of the Soviet Union. So the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine, what was that? Basically, that once a nation, he'd said, once a nation goes communist, it must remain communist, even by armed intervention as in Czechoslovakia in 1968. What he was saying, once you're a communist, you're gonna be a, always a communist. Hmm, that sounds a, a little fishy. So he was saying, basically saying, um, communist countries were not allowed to um, come out of communism. They, they were forever communist. Brezhnev doctrine pretty much was not, not good, right? Um, saying that a communist country had no choice in the matter. Hmm. The communists agreed to rep respect such human rights. They said, we'll, ex we'll respect human rights as freedom of thought, and we'll give them freedom of religion and freedom of, con of conscience, which they did none of those things. This promise to respect freedom proved to be a very hollow one. They said what they were going to do, but they never, ever did, right? There were no freedoms of human, human rights in communist countries. There wasn't any freedom of religion or freedom of conscience. No way. And the Bresnik Doctrine basically said they would not be allowed to be helped by the free countries. Hmm. 1975. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, um, he warned the West. He was a famous Russian writer who had been imprisoned in the Soviet Union for exposing the cruelties of communism. So he came, as he came to America, and warned the West not to be fooled into thinking that detente would bring peace. If you go in there and say, oh, we're going to be friends with you, that would not bring peace. He said, the communist ideology is to destroy your society. This has been their aim for 125 years and has never changed. Only the methods have changed a little, he said. When there is detente, peaceful coexistence and trade, they will still insist. The ideological war must continue. You can be friends with us, but we're going to continue our Cold War. And what is this ideological war? It is a focus of hatred. It is continued repetition of the oath to destroy the Western world. The SALT Treaties. The United States continued to offer tokens of peace to the communists throughout the 1970s. In 1972, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. That's SALT. Strategic Arms, that's limiting arms, strategic arms limitation um, to, limit, uh, to limit nuclear weapons. SALT 1 and then SALT 2 treaty in 1978. So in 1972 was SALT 1. In 1978 was SALT 2 and they further reduced their nuclear weapons stockpiles. Basically, SALT treaties was trying to get rid of nuclear weapons. The communists showed no intention of keeping these treaties at all. So we put forth the SALT treaties and only we followed them, the, and the free countries, not the communist countries. They had no inkling to get rid of or, or to limit their arms, their um, nuclear weapon policy. Hmm. And on to the Panama Canal. This was um, pretty sad, too. In 1978, President Carter, now um, at the United Nations, you know, he's President, um, President Nixon was impeached 
well, he actually resigned. He was going to be impeached and he resigned. Um, President Ford became president for a short time and then President Carter um, was elected. In 1978, President Carter at the United Nations negotiated the surrender of the Panama Canal Zone to Panama and withdrawal of troops from the region by 1999. Yes, many Americans fear the dangerous association with this move. The Panama Canal, of course, is a vital link in military and commercial interests of that canal. And now Panama, Panama being controlled by socialistic and communist affairs and the turmoils of Panama, and we, we would surrender it to Panama? Hmm. So under this, again, um, we're negating um, the power and the integrity, you know, um, of America compared to communist countries, right? Hmm. The Wars of Liberation. In spite of the spirit of detente, the communist bloc launched wars of national liberation throughout the 1970s and 1980s that brought communist revolutions to Africa, Central America, Asia, and the Pacific. Remember, the wars, they would they would um, come in and say, you need to be independent, but they had no idea on what independence was. And so the communist um, uh, dictators would come in in the midst of all the turmoil and take over. One of the most brutal wars of liberation resulted after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. Hmm. I don't know that even today. The free world realized that the appeasement of communist aggression had earned nothing but failure and a weakened resolve to keep fighting communism. So now uh -huh, the free world is realizing that if we're just appeasing communist aggression, it's going it's going to we're going to have to keep um, keep our eye because um, now it would weaken our fighting it, and as communism would s sneak in to many countries around the world. So we see this picture. You see, I always see this picture right here with this hand, and you think if only they'd put one finger up to heaven, that Jesus, you know, that's what I think of. Um, the, Jesus is the answer still, even to all of these problems. But we see these wars of national liberation, and we talked about them and what was happening and how communists snuck into these areas and to these peoples, ma many of them third world countries that didn't have organized governments and would take over by terrorism. Now on to the space age, the tribute to freedom. So we're talking about America during this time, and of course, this is amazing time with what was going on in, uh, in us going to the moon, you know, in our space age race with Russia. There is no question that the sy system of freedom is far superior to a system of slavery, right? There's no question. When there's a system of freedom, everyone is working freely, and it's superior to being made to um, bow to a communist slavery, right? In 1960s, America gave the world an astonishing example of what the free men living in a free nation can do. America put a man on the moon. Huh. In 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik 1, and that was the world's first man-made satellite you know, that, that went up, Sputnik. So here, Soviets, Russia are going to space. I'm wondering, well, they're going to space to bring weapons in space? Mm-hmm. So this made the free world very apprehensive, saying they're launching space weapons. And then the communists proclaimed that the space age technology would prove that the communist system was scientifically superior to capitalism. The space race. In 1961, the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. A Russian was the first man in space, making a single orbit of the Earth. He orbited the Earth. The Americans then were determined to catch up and beat the Soviets in this space race. President Kennedy 
committed the United States to land a man on the moon before 1970. He said, we will land a man on the moon, President Kennedy. That's a, that's pretty, that's, that's pretty a big statement, isn't it? In 1966, American astronauts had made several trial orbital flights and equaled or bettered the communist record. So we put, as we're putting it into the space race, we're leaping far ahead of Soviets, the Soviet space race, racing with them. On Christmas Eve, 1968, millions of people around the world heard the American astronauts of Apollo 8 read from the Bible, Genesis in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And they, as they orbited the moon, they read the Bible. How spectacular is that? One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. On July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 with astronaut Neil Armstrong became the first man to step onto the surface of the moon. Millions of television viewers all over the world watched. Armstrong spoke, that's one step for man, one giant leap for mankind. On the surface of the moon, the Americans erected a flag and placed a plaque which read, we came in peace for all mankind. Hmm. We came in peace for all mankind. A triumph for free men, for all free men. The lunar moon landing was a triumph. Individual laborers, scientists, engineers, they all worked together for private corporations uh, on this space race, on uh, going to the moon. In a sense, not one man, but an entire nation went to the moon. The Apollo program was also a triumph for modern science, economically and politically too. All of the products of the human race. The victory of the United States in the space race proved what a nation of free men can do.